So, what are you running for? So, these are my running shoes. I haven't actually worn them in very long to actually run. Uh, and the reason for that is because who knows that running actually comes with some strain. It comes with some aches and pains <laughs> afterwards. And it leaves you, well, it leaves me feeling like I'm dead. And I don't want to move in a while. Um, so it becomes a real mental block for me from actually wanting to run. Because, yeah, I don't want to be tired. I don't want to waste my energy. I don't want to hurt afterwards. So it kind of puts me off. But actually, running is healthy for you, you know. Um, I'm speaking to that to myself right now, too. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's good for you. Running is good for you. So, before we begin, what else is running? Running, you need some prep before the race. You need to do that behind-the-scenes work. You need to do some training. Make sure you're fit and healthy. You need to make sure your heart's in a good place and your mind's in a good place that actually running is easier with others, whether that's running alongside someone else to cheer each other on, or whether that's being a crowd that's cheering you on at every step of the way. That actually exercise begins with a struggle, but actually uh, once we step out of our comfort zones, we end up growing, we end up being stretched, and it ends up being good for us. And sometimes there's obstacles along the way. We have to dodge them here and there, make sure we're not tripping over. Um, and yeah, did you know that we are all in a race? In Hebrews 12, 1 to 3, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance to race marked out for us fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So, what are you running for? So, our race. As Christians, we have a purpose in Christ. We might have an individual calling on our lives, a purpose for us to run, run for God. And actually, as a body of Christ as well, we might have an individual calling, but we are also called to be one body. So we are God's people on the earth. And what are we called to run for? We are called to run for God's glory. We are called to share God's glory with the nations, to love God and love others. We are called into the Great Commission to share his love with the world. It is the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. But as I was preparing, God also asked the question, what are you running for? So sometimes our purpose looks scary. It looks like we can't do it. But it, and we're, I'm going to quickly go through a few characters that actually run away from God, run away from their purpose. And the first character I want to look at is Jonah. Jonah, we, we might know the story, but Jonah, he was called to Nineveh, a nation who uh, Jonah was just like, they're great sinners. I don't really like those people. Um, I don't, I, they're not my people. And therefore, why would I want to go and speak to them? Um, he was led by his emotions. He was led by his feelings. So he ran the other way. He wanted to get away from that calling because he said, I don't want to do that. But then what happened? He got swallowed by a while, and God led him back the other way to then preach to the nation of Nineveh. And God saved those people. So God, even in the midst of us running away, he brings us back to repentance. He's turning us back the other way. So even though he was led by his feelings and emotions, who knows here that sometimes we could be led by our feelings and emotions, that actually in our purpose, we can turn back the other way. The next person I want to look at is Moses. So I'm going to pass over to my wonderful wife, Sharon. Yeah, so um, before I share about Moses, I actually wanted to share bit about my testimony, something I went through. This is recent. This isn't like a decade ago. So this is like in March, April, May. I was actually really looking forward to getting back into mental health. So I was actually applying for jobs, okay? And I was hoping to go for like 
full time. Like, go back. Like, I miss psychology. And on the side, as part of, like, a British Psychology Society member, I was like, let me try and get back to my counselling psychology registration and training. Like, let's, let's do that, you know? Like, it's been seven years. I really miss it so much. So here I was, almost feeling like, yeah, like, I know this is something, like, I'm meant to do. And, oh, okay, so application after application... Opportunity after opportunity, closed door. No, sorry, unsuccessful. Really uh, looking for someone else right now. And I was like, Lord, like, what is going on? Like, we're not used to this. This isn't what happens. Normally, maybe we apply or we go for it, and stuff usually happens. So what is happening? And so let's just say that continued for a while. And I was praying, I was, you know, with the pastors. I just want to honor Pastor Alex and Pastor Dorcas because they're also my employers, right? I also work for the church, for those who don't know. And so Pastor Alex is, meanwhile, just praying, Lord, you speak to Sharon. They're not manipulating me or doing anything to keep me in my church role, right? They're just like, Lord, you speak. We want her to be in, in the calling that you've set out for her. You speak to her. Open her heart. Open her ears to hear you, Lord. So meanwhile, Sharon's kind of doing a Jonah, right? running away a little bit, what am I running from? Okay, now this is the interesting bit. Here's why the door kept closing, because it wasn't a no, it was a big not yet. Okay, I was trying to get there too early. And that wasn't what God was saying right here, right now. Now I'm going to honor Pastor Dorcas, who um, every fortnight Wednesday we meet as mentoring leaders and others have come along just to pray, seek God, encourage one another. And in that space, I was like, okay, Jesus, I'm just going to have a real talk with you, okay? I'm really sorry if I didn't do this enough and meditating with you enough. But what is actually happening? What is my purpose right now? Am I meant to go for this psychology-related job and get back into it or something else? And honestly, God said something that really freaked me out. He said, well, that's, that's a big not yet. But instead, to invest more time in my business, my coaching business, which is so scary, I just want to say. Because all the entrepreneurs here, there's some right here in front of me, amazing, and their inspirations all to me. It's, it's unstable. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen with income. It is hard work and it is effort. I'm like, no, no, no. I want to stick to what is stable. I want to stick to what I know. That just sounds really scary. But for other reasons, God was saying a big not yet. Because this next season I am stepping into, God knows what that looks like. God knows where he's taking me. God knows why this requires my full obedience but I was doing a Jonah. So I'm being very honest with myself and sharing for the first time with all of you. Now, why was I doing a Jonah? Because deep down, let me be so, so real with you. I haven't shared this in public, so this is my first time, okay? In my roles as our community and admin worker, in my heart, sometimes I don't feel not good enough. I don't, I don't feel good enough, sorry. I don't feel like this is a role that I can fulfill. This is a role that I can do because... Growing up, childhood wounds or whatever of my father wanting a son and not a daughter, I constantly had this sense of feeling out of place, not belonging, someone else being better than me. So I show up, I do the thing, and I give it my all. But on the inside, God was pointing out, there's still healing to go, my girl. There's still a way to go. And often I've had people saying, why are you running, Sharon? I feel like God wants to say to you, why are you running? I'm running because I'm not actually running towards God, towards his purposes, towards his plans, towards his loving, laid out, glorious, beautiful plans for me. I'm running because something inside me keeps niggling. The enemy keeps whispering. And all these ugly things that keep me from truly feeling like I belong. And I know some of you have blessed me and have encouraged me and said, Sharon, I love what you do in LNC, da 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 da, da. And I, I promise you, I have received that. I thank you so much. But in my heart, on the deeper levels, God was doing this. So when I realized I was running, I was like, Lord, I don't want to be disobedient. I don't want to be running from you. I want to be running towards you and the things that you have called me to do, the plans and purposes you have for me. And I thank you that you qualify me. I thank you that you show me why I belong. I thank you that you are the one that says, this child, next step, here we go, together, in partnership. Because when I run, I run on my own. But when we run with Jesus, we are never alone, like we just sang. Never abandoned. So the purpose makes sense. 
The plans make sense. The belonging just fits. And you sit in that place. And, okay, then when I said, okay, Lord, all right, if that's what you're saying for my next season, I'm not going to run from my church role, from the turning, from this anymore. I will be here, even if I'm uncomfortable, and even if I'm still in somewhat of a healing place. Um, and even with the business, I trust you because you are my CEO. That's what I always say. Jesus is my CEO and I'm second in charge. So I listen to him. The Holy Spirit gives the inspiration. So even in that, whatever that looks like, I'm going to sit with you and you are going to talk to me about it. And honestly, the moment I decided that big fat yes, everything just started falling into place. The week after, the two weeks after, different people, either business related or whatever, just kept encouraging me, saying, hey, I was thinking if you want to do this with you, da, 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 da. I'm like, oh, man, I like, I could have spared myself two or three months of this closed door, closed door, feeling not good enough, like, oh, my goodness, have I been away from psychology for too long that now it's like I can't do it anymore? All this silliness I could have avoided because actually when we are running from our purpose, when we are running away from God, Things don't fall into place, and then we think there's something wrong with us. But it's because we're not aligned. When we are aligned with the word, the standard, and the purposes of God, it's not always hard. It actually is a flow. There's an ease to it. There's a blessing in it. There's a movement. There's a momentum in it. And that is what Jonah saw. He stayed in the well. That could have been equivalent of his two to three months. I, I did two to three months. He did like a few days. And he was like, okay, Lord, I'm going to obey you. And then he saved a whole people because he got over himself. Amen. He stopped running. So thank you, Lord. Amen. Next slide, please. So now there's a bit about Moses. Okay, We all know about Moses' story, the dude that parted the sea, saved the Israelites from Egypt. How exciting, amazing. But where did he start Okay, he had life BC before Christ. Okay, <laughs> uh, he was this kind of adopted, not actually Egyptian child that grew up. Okay, so it wasn't raised in the kingdom, we can say. But then, kind of murders somebody and he runs off. And he's gone off for 40 years. This isn't just a few years. He's gone and in the wilderness, God is doing stuff. He's speaking to him. We know about the burning bush. He's like, ah, oh, Lord, oh, holy ground. Oh, my goodness. So then he encounters the Lord Jesus, right? So everyone in the Old Testament, when they're encountering God, they're actually also encountering Jesus because he's the same God. And from there, his story begins. But then when he comes back, what really stuck out to me as we were going through this is actually when God commissions him to save the Israelites, Moses is so focused on his stutter, so focused on how not good enough he is because he cannot speak properly. He's like, I can't, Lord. Disqualify me. I do not fit the bill. I do not fit this role and position you have for me. And God is so kind he, because Moses is not there yet. Okay, So God meets Moses where he's at. And he says, pardon your servant. Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. So that's what Moses says. And so God says to him, okay, I'll bring Aaron along. You know, he, Aaron, Moses will be kind of like God to you. And Aaron, you'll be like a prophet. Basically, you'll be the mouthpiece that will hear what God is saying. And you will release that to Pharaoh and all of the stories that happen after so what got me there was actually God chose Moses, God called Moses, God anointed and appointed Moses, and it's okay that Moses still needed help. He wasn't able to do it on his own because he wasn't there yet. But then I found it so interesting as we kept reading and looking into Moses, the more Moses encounters God's presence, the more he's moving in the miracles, the more he's standing in his purpose, even on the mountain, right? There's less of Aaron, right? So think about the fact that Moses is up on the mountain. He's encountered God's presence. He comes back. His hair is all gray because the holiness of God has physically transformed this man. Meanwhile, Aaron was down there helping the Israelites who were impatient and couldn't wait anymore, making some idols. Okay? So from then on, you no longer see Moses relying on Aaron because the presence of God had moved him and transformed him so much that he's now able to just speak. 
He now no longer is so focused on his stutter. He is so determined to release the purposes of God, to release the word of God, to be in the presence of God and to know his God. That becomes his focus. And all of a sudden, the, the, the emphasis on stutter is gone. You no longer hear, oh, Lord, you're not so eloquent servant. God is saying, my people, God is doing, my people, stop with this. Let's repent. Let's turn from our sin. Let's turn from our wicked ways and move into the ways of God. So when we are fixated on our not good enoughs, we lose sight of our purpose, God's presence, and the glory that he wants to shine through us. You'll often hear our preachers say, if God can get it through you, he'll give it to you. He will release it through you because he can trust you. And even if we're going through a not there yet, it's okay to receive help. It's okay to do it with others. It's okay that we're still a work in progress because none of us is Jesus. We're actually never going to be perfect. We're never going to get the task perfect, the purpose perfect, the relationship perfect. But in our imperfection, there is a perfect God through his love, helping us, guiding us into his purposes. I'm going to hand it back to Anthony. Thanks, my love. So I really relate to Moses because I've always seen that actually I'm not eloquent in speech, that actually I don't know what to say sometimes, that even in socializing I get a bit anxious and it's a bit like, oh, this is awkward. Um, but actually God has called me to be a light in the world. So actually sometimes I have to lay myself aside and actually be like, okay, Jesus, you take the will because actually right now I can't do this. So please, Lord, just use me for your glory. Um, when I was younger, I was really on fire as a Christian, and I really wanted to preach on buses and trains and different stuff like that. Um, but actually, forgive me, Lord, I was too afraid. I was too scared. I would hold back. I'd be like, actually, no one else is doing this, so I can't do this. Who am I to think that I could do this? And the thing is, actually, I couldn't do that. I needed to trust in Jesus. And actually, it's not by might. It's not by power, but it's by his spirit. But actually, for me, I don't like being the center of attention. Even being up here today is a bit nerve-wracking for me. And I'm like, oh, I'd rather not. <laughs> but actually, <laughs> God has called me with a purpose to bring him glory. So that's why I'm standing here today, because it's not about me. It's about him. So that's what I'm here for today. <laughs> So the Lord has really had to work on my heart with that, though, because actually it's about stepping aside so that Jesus can move, because it really isn't about us. It's about the God who can move mountains, that can do amazing things in people's lives, and we're just a vessel to be a flow of his spirit. So, yeah. I wasn't really doing what God wanted me to do, but he's changed my life now. Now I could be the light that I was hiding. Do not hide your light under a bushel, but let it shine. So, <laughs> praise God. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so it's trusting in God and his faithfulness, not just our own merit, not just our own things. So when we're running, we're running for him. We're not running for ourselves. And therefore, he gives us the power to do that. He gives us that strength to keep persevering, to run the race that he has set out for us. Yeah, he can do far greater than we can ask or imagine when we just put the pressure off of ourselves and onto Jesus because actually he carries the weight of the world. He can change the world. He could change nations. We can't do that ourselves, but he can. Thank you, Jesus. And I just want to share that actually the turning is really great for this as well because speaking to strangers on the street that you don't know, especially about faith, that's a hard thing to do. That's quite scary, especially as an introvert for me. I'm like, ah! But actually, God empowers us to do that by his spirit. And actually, in that, we find that God is healing people in the street, that actually lives are being changed, they're being transformed, and they're coming to know salvation and God as their Lord and Savior, which is so exciting. Thank you, Lord. And that's all about laying aside yourself so that God can step in. And in the words of John the Baptist, God must become greater, I must become less. So I personally believe that faith isn't the absence of doubt or fear. <laughs> I 
okay. I personally believe that faith isn't the absence of doubt or fear, but by choosing to trust in God's faithfulness in the midst of it, to change that faith, that fear into faith. So it's actually laying aside how we're feeling, how we're, how we're doing, but actually saying, actually, God, I put my trust in you. It's not about me, it's about you. So, why are you running? <laughs> so it's not about trusting what we know. We could read the Bible, we could say, oh, God can do that. But actually, it's about who we know. It's about Jesus. It's the difference between knowledge, faith, which is, oh, yeah, I believe God can do that because someone else said that he could do that. And actually, the tangible faith, which is like, I've seen him do that before, and therefore, I know he will do it again. For he is good. He can and he will. The Israelites are constantly reminding themselves through song and through stories to generation to generation that God parted that Red Sea and that if he did it before, he can do it again. That actually miracles can happen. God is the God of the impossible. And that although we can't do it in the natural, God can do the supernatural. And that is also the power of our testimony. That's why we come up here on a Sunday and testify, because actually that is stirring each other's faith to believe God for the impossible. I'm really seeing this in finance at the moment, that actually sometimes when you're not getting that money at the end of the month and you're like, oh, Lord, what's going to happen now? Um, I've seen him provide before, and therefore I believe he'll do it again. But who knows that sometimes doubt gets in the way. Fear comes crippling in. But that's when we have to turn back to Jesus and trust in his faithfulness. In Matthew 17, 20, the disciples are trying to cast out demons. And they can't do this. So they come to Jesus and say, why can't we do this? Why is it not happening? And Jesus replies, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And who knows that a mustard seed is very, very, very tiny. It's not big at all. And actually, the smallest trust in God means anything is possible for us because it's not trusting on what we could do. It's what God can do. And actually, in Matthew 7, 7 to 8, it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. So that leads me to the question, what are we trusting God for? Our faith in God also depends on how we see him. Do we truly believe God is who he says he is? That he is good? Or have we believed the lie that the enemy has spoken to us to rob us from running the race with God's fullness in our lives? I know for me, as a teenager and growing up, in, uh, not necessarily in the faith, but having doubts, I was just like, is God really real? I can't see him, so how can I believe in him? But actually, the more I spent time in God's presence in my room in worship, the more I encountered Jesus, and therefore, if you've met someone, you can't really doubt their existence. So that gave me that tangible faith where it's just like, actually, I can run for God now because I can't doubt his existence. I've met him face to face. In the presence of Jesus, everything else was stripped away. It was just like any sins, any doubts, any insecurities, uh, they were being melted away in the presence of Jesus. That's the importance of prayer and presence, and that leads us to our purpose. That's what we're looking at this year, no? And that actually, I was doubting if God is really a healer, does God still heal today? And it wasn't until I stepped out in faith and prayed for different people, whether that's on the street or whether that was my mum who really hurt her ankle once. So we, I prayed for her, laid hands on her. It was about a 10. And then when I prayed for her, it went down to a 3. So God healed her. And then I was just like, but that's not enough, Lord. We want to see that completely healed in the name of Jesus. And then actually God really healed her. She was not in pain anymore. And that enabled the Lord to speak to her and say, actually... You can get baptized now. You don't have to withhold yourself from me. So it was that faith in action that inspired her to get baptized. And I had the presence of the privilege to baptize her. Thank you, Jesus. 
So I know that God can heal and that he will because I've seen him do it before. He will do it again. And actually, God, as provider, I actually had to work on my heart from this because in my past, my family never had enough money. So uh, I had to really search my heart before the Lord to say, actually, what's going on here? I don't feel like I could trust, trust God as provider. And that's because I didn't know whether my family could provide. And therefore, that kind of impacts my view on God of, can you provide for me? So I had to really sort of repent of believing that God is not my provider, that he cannot provide, and actually receive the truth that actually God is provider, nothing is impossible for him, and therefore he will provide. So God can heal our innermost parts. And that is kind of the prep before the race that I want to bring today, is that actually in prayer and presence of Jesus, it's the behind the scenes work that we need to do, that heart prep to help us run free, that reflecting, that repenting, and hearing God for the truth. We can be free to run. So, we are called to freedom in Christ. So I want to read these Bible verses. It says, Who the Son sets free is free indeed. That where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. That we are no longer slaves, but children of God. And I remember a few years back, I had the picture of chains breaking off. There were shackles lying on the ground. I was in sin at that time, and I was bound by it. There was, I didn't believe God could use me because I was so covered in shame. Um, but actually, the Lord showed me a picture that those chains have been broken because of the cross. And that actually, God was calling me to run in that freedom. But actually, I was too comfortable in my chains. Who knows that our chains can become comfortable when there's work outside to be done? We might feel like, actually, I don't want to make that effort because that's a lot of effort. But actually, uh, there is freedom in the name of Jesus. Um, So he called me out of those chains. I had that choice to choose my own selfish desires or to choose God and his will and purpose for my life. And actually, with a lot of healing done behind the scenes, God has now set me free from those chains. And that I can now run free because the weight and sin that we carry that so easily entangles us has been dealt with at the cross. We are free to run. All of creation calls out for the sons and daughters of God to arise. So, can we arise? So, what are these sin and weights that so easily entangle us? Okay, so let's have a real talk, heart check, and really assess how am I doing? What are my chains? Okay? So, we all know that sin separates us from God. That is how it started, and that hasn't changed. When we sin and we stay in sin and we continue in that disobedient place, I know for sure I relate to this. Do you ever find you're struggling to hear God's voice? You're struggling to feel the nudges of the Holy Spirit like you once used to in such a sharp and discerning way? Sin has that power. It is ugly. It is disgusting. It is a God barrier. It is a relationship barrier, whether that be relationship with those that you know or with God. So whatever that is, it is worth asking, if there is something in my life, Lord, would you reveal it so I am no longer separated from you, your plans, and your purposes? Because it is not okay, my brothers and sisters, that we live in sin. This is not the plan and purpose that God has for his children, and that is not what you deserve. You deserve absolute freedom. I deserve absolute freedom, free from shame, free from sin, free from the condemnation of the enemy because that cycle just keeps continuing, continuing and continuing. Freedom is our portion. Freedom is our purpose, and running into him brings that. And then there's insecurities. We are all prone to insecurities, and I mentioned some of mine. The feeling not good enough, feeling too big, too small, too loud, too quiet, too tall, too short. It is this constant inner voice that says, this is the standard and you are here. But who determined that standard? 
Because if that standard that you are cross-checking with is not the word of God, and it is the world, it is gossip, it is the whispers of the enemy, if that is the standard you are comparing yourself to, know that we are already defeated. And defeat looks like staying in our insecurities, continuing in the I'm not good enough, continuing in the shouts of the world when you see on social media the comparison, the imposter syndrome, that they've got this and I don't have this, all of that. This is not our portion. So let's see, are these my chains? Because if God has called you to magnificent, great, and incredible things, and these are the chains, break it! Break it in the name of Jesus and be free because you are amazing. You are chosen and called by King Jesus for incredible plans. Jesus says that you will be able to do even greater things than me. Three years, he did a lot. And we have years to have fun with. Years to live out in freedom, free from insecurities. And then there's the fears, fear of the future. Fear of the past repeating itself. Fear of trauma reoccurring. Fear of if this happens, oh my goodness, what if that happens? Fear of money never coming into the bank account. Fear of never getting married. Fear of the marriage eventually breaking down because maybe that's a story you've heard or that's someone else that said something. Fear of that job never coming. Fear of an employee or a boss that will just continually be a certain way. Fear is not our portion. Because we do not have a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. So if there is fear in our lives, let us break it. Embracing God's power, embracing God's love. Anytime you feel unloved or like no one loves you, that is an absolute lie. God loves you so much. He loves you so uniquely because he made you, formed you in your mother's womb. God loves my craziness. I even now say, Jesus, you made this so you can put up with this. (laughs) All of this, (laughs) everything I come with. So now I'm no longer fearful of what people might think of me. I'm no longer fearful of what the future is going to hold. I'm no longer fearful of money because my God has provided. My God loves me so much. And my God has proved time and 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 time again that he never breaks his promises. He never breaks his word. And that applies to all of us because you are also a child of God. If you love the Lord Jesus, know that you are a child of God. And then there's the comparison. I kind of talked about that. I honestly say to Anthony, coming into London from New Zealand, this is something I see. I would call this almost like a principality over the city or over the nation. Like comparison is such a big thing. Competition in that is such a big thing. My brothers, my sisters, we need to break that. Instead, let's celebrate each other. Kara, I celebrate you. Pastor Dorcas, I celebrate you. Anne, I celebrate you. Joshua, I celebrate you. (laughs) Ife, I celebrate you. Let's be a people with a culture that celebrate and do not compare, that honor, outdo in showing honor, than compete. Because that is snuffing out God's light amongst us. That is snuffing out purpose between us. That is snuffing out the freedom. So let's get rid of those chains too, okay? And then there's lies that we've believed about God, ourselves, or others. So if you've done ancient past, you'll be also familiar how from a very young age or as life circumstances happen or trauma, there's lies that get deposited in our heart that determine our behavior, our actions, our perceptions of ourselves, others, and God. And if we live out, if we continue to live out those lies, we all know this from our own experiences, we're never fully safe in relationships or don't feel good enough in certain situations, or like someone's going to let us down, or something's going to go wrong. So those lies, the Holy Spirit has probably hinted and highlighted down here. Please don't ignore that, because that's him saying, please, let's get rid of this. We don't need this anymore. This is a lie. This is not a truth from God. 
please let's sit in a place of truth about who God is. He is good. He is faithful. He is kind and he is just. And he will never fail. And he will never abandon. And others as well. If, if we do not love ourselves. You know the, the second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself, right? And the point of reference is as yourself. So if you are struggling to love yourself, receive the love of God, and stand in that security of what he has spoken, then the way that you love other people, your friend, your um, co-worker, your spouse, that will definitely be impacted. Because the negativity we feel, the not good enough, the insecurities, the lies that we are holding on to, they're chains, right? We can choose. It's a choice. We can choose to break free of these chains. Anthony mentioned that we get comfortable because that becomes what we know. So let's break that off as well so we are able to love others free of shame, free of comparison, free of competition, free of all the things that have held us back because God's intended not just our relationship with him to flourish, but our relationship to flourish with others as well. And then there's anxiety, the low self-worth, and pride. My goodness. I think a a while back, um, Kara mentioned some word. I think it was in the Soaking Sunday, wasn't it? That actually, when we refuse to, I think, receive help or something along those lines, or uh, I can't remember (laughs) what it was. But anyway, that that pride also is us not, not just being disobedient, but also us not being willing to receive exactly what God is doing through others around us and through what he has spoken. And that doesn't just mean I think I'm so much better than everybody. Pride is also, I can do this on my own. I don't need anybody else because if I do it, I know that I will do it the best way. But what we will miss out on is collaboration, is unity, and multiple opportunities to learn. So if we have an isolated do it on my own, I can handle this kind of way about us, break it. My brothers, my sisters, break it. Because we were made to be in family, adopted into family. We weren't made to stay isolated. We weren't made to suffer on our own. If the Bible says when one suffers, all parts suffers. When one is rejoicing, all parts rejoice. If that is the standard, why are we outside of it? I know I'm guilty of this. Many times I'm like, oh, I could do it on my own. And God's like, no, that's not how I made you. I'm like, oh, but it'd just be easier. We weren't made for the easy life. It's the narrow road that we walk through. It's the narrow road. So why on earth are you wanting easy? I'm sorry. Life with Jesus doesn't come easy. So if no one's ever said that to you, I'm really sorry. That's the truth. Okay. It includes suffering. It includes disappointments. It includes going up the grain. It includes people not liking you. It includes being misunderstood. It includes looking odd. It includes feeling like you're the only one and no one else is following you. That is what life with Jesus looks like. But are we alone? No. Because King Jesus, the Holy Spirit, loving Father, all of them in one are with us right here, right here, around all the time. So thank you, Lord. Low self-worth. We're just going to leave that at the door. Anyone that walked in here with low self-worth, you're going to walk out without it. Okay, you're going to break that today. The chains are going to break. All these chains are going to break because we are together going to run towards Jesus, towards our Father. All right. I'm going to call up Anthony. So yeah, as mentioned with pride, that actually it's easier together with people to collaborate with them, to run that race, to run alongside people, to strengthen each other so that you are arm in arm. So even if one person falls down, you could lift each other up, that you could cheer each other on and keep running. And that, that there's different circles in our lives that Sharon's going to quickly unpack about who we're running with. Yes. So in the um, different areas of our lives, I was thinking about this, actually, Um, with God, with other people. So think of when I'm at work, when I'm with my friends, in my romantic relationship, when I'm on my own, what does that look like? And what what are the chains that manifest? 
in these different areas because we are called to a holistic lifestyle. That's Hebrew kind of lifestyle, isn't it? Not a Greek mindset, a Greek lifestyle where this area is this way, that area is that way, and they stay separated. But all together, God is God overall. So he is moving in all those areas. So let's also check my inner circle. Who are my Peter, James, and John when it comes to friends? Who are my colleagues, my co-workers that I can maybe turn to, rely on, receive help from with a particular task, with a particular thing? Who are my life group people that I can open up to and share? I'm going through this. I'm, I'm going to admit that I need help here. I'm struggling here. I hate admitting this, but I need to because that's humility. You're breaking pride when that happens. And in other areas, those are just some examples. We need people and we need each other. Surround yourself with the children of God because at least you know you're running towards the same standard. We're running towards the things of God. Yeah. And while you're running, you don't want to have to keep slowing down or stopping to try and drag others along with you, but running with people who are at the same pace as you to keep you running fresh and fast for what God has called you to do. You don't want to have to keep dragging people behind you to try and uh, get them to that place where you are too. But sometimes also, if God has called you to do that, to pick other people up, to run with you, then to be obedient in that too. And that actually, it's easier to run with the crowd around you to cheer each other on. And who knows that we are surrounded by angels who are cheering us on. The host of heaven are cheering us on in the race we are running. So we are never alone. We have each other to cheer each other on to run the race. And exercise begins with struggle. It's out of our comfort zone. We don't grow unless we stretch ourselves. But it's the same in our run with God, that actually we're not going to grow if we're not running. If we're staying still, we're not going to grow. We need to stretch ourselves. We need to step out of our comfort zone and run with all perseverance to race God has set out for us. And that means breaking off those weights and sin that easily entangle us. So coming to a conclusion now. And a few important questions to ask ourselves are, are you running for glory or are you running for God's glory? Are you running for the approval of others or are you running for God? Are you running from the pain or are you running to Jesus who is the healer? Just like in Auntie Shelley's preach a few weeks ago, she was sharing how just one touch of Jesus' hem of his robe, we are changed and transformed forever. We can run to him for our healing. Joshua 1.9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. We don't need to fear or be afraid. So what does it mean for, for you to truly be free? What does that look like? And what is holding you back from trusting in God's faithfulness, his faith, not ours? There's a spontaneous song that Baffle sang where it said, freedom's calling you into the family room where you can be yourself. You don't have to be anybody else. So freedom is yours in Christ because of the cross. You are free, but you are being called into that freedom. You are being free from any pain, any hurts, any insecurities, any lies you've believed. You're free to run in that intimate place with the Lord, to run with all perseverance. You can be yourself. You could be who God has called you to be for what he has done in your lives. So as a response, I just want you guys to join me in throwing off these weights and chains today because you are called to freedom. So let's have that freedom today. I believe God wants us to be in that freedom. So if you can and are able, I invite you to kneel with us um, just as a posture before God to say, I surrender these things. So if you want to, you could stand out of your seats. If you want to just stay sitting, but with your heart posture knelt before the Lord, then you can kneel before God with us. And if it's easier, you could close your eyes, focus on Jesus. And we're just going to repent of some things as well right here, right now. So, Father, we repent from putting ourselves first and on the throne and limiting you, God, for what you want to do. For not putting your 
putting you first, Lord. We repent of this now in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Give you space as well to really say this to God in your heart. We repent for putting ourselves first, Lord. We put you back on the throne of our lives, Lord. We don't want any limitations from you for moving to here today in Jesus' name. And Lord, we repent from withholding any part of our lives from you. And Lord, I repent from any sin that's been holding me back from running the race freely for you, Jesus. We repent in Jesus' name. And Father, right here, right now, would you reveal any lies we've believed about you, any lies we've believed about ourselves, or lies we have believed about others? Speak to us now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, if you've revealed to us any of those lies, Lord, we repent now for believing those lies in Jesus' name. We break them off in Jesus' name. And Father, speak to us now. What is the truth? What are you saying over our lives, Lord? Yes, Jesus. Thank speak to us now in Jesus' name. What are you saying, Lord? Yes, Jesus. Thank you. One of the things God is saying, yes, you can. Yes, you can. You've given up, but God says, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. That's one of the words that God's speaking over many lives today. And the confession is powerful. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And Father, we lay down any weight that has stopped us from running the race. And we place it at your feet, King Jesus place it at your feet, Lord. And Lord, we exchange our shame for your glory in the name of Jesus. We are free in you. We are free in you, Lord. And if there's anything in these slides that you might feel in your heart today, lay them at the feet of Jesus. We are free in Jesus because of the cross. Lord, we surrender. We surrender in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We are free. In the words of the turning, when you make a mistake, don't run away from God, but run to him because he really does love you and has an awesome plan for your life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, we are yours. We want to run this race for you. Help us to run to you and not from you. Help us to run the race with all perseverance, Lord race you set before us, Lord. Know that freedom you call in our name, in your name, Jesus. And we also want to offer a space that if you feel like you're prompted to have any more ministry, we are happy to, um, yeah, pray alongside you up the front. But Lord, we give you glory in this place, Lord. We run for you. We repent and we turn to you. Thank you that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We invite your Spirit today, Lord more of you and less of us in Jesus name Amen. thank you Jesus <laughs>